One of the experiments that demonstrate the wave nature of light is Young's double slit experiment. When shining light through two narrow slits, one can observe an interference pattern on a screen behind the slit, and this interference pattern can be explained by assuming that light is a wave. However, we don't always observe interference fringes. For example, with laser light we can easily create fringes, but with sunlight or light from a normal lamp it is much more difficult to achieve. This is our main question. What determines whether we can use certain light to form interference fringes? The answer to this question lies in the theory of coherence. So what is coherence? Let's try to explain this first intuitively, and once that's done we can look deeper into the mathematics. First, let's consider the case where we can observe interference fringes. We illuminate the double slit with a plane wave that is time harmonic, so it's monochromatic. Because the field is time harmonic, the phase difference between the fields at different points is constant in time, which is why we can describe the field with a time independent complex valued function. The amplitude of this complex value describes the amplitude of the oscillation, and the phase of this complex value describes the phase difference between oscillations at different points. The field in the plane of the double slit can thus be described by two complex numbers, where each complex number describes the field in one slit. If we assume the amplitudes in both slits are equal to 1, we can write the fields as complex exponentials with phases phi1 and phi2, and so the phase difference between them is given by phi2 minus phi1. Either by checking path length differences or by calculating the Fraunhofer diffraction integral, one can find that the intensity in the far field oscillates as a function of position, which is our interference pattern. If we change the phase difference between the two slits, which we could for example do by changing the angle of the incident plane wave, we can shift the position of the interference pattern. So what can happen so that we don't get interference fringes in the far field? So far, we've considered a time harmonic field, which means that the phase differences are fixed in time. But what if we consider a field that is not time harmonic, so that the phase difference can vary in time? What happens then is that the position of the interference pattern changes in time. Now suppose that the phase difference fluctuates so quickly that we can only measure the time averaged intensity. In that case, the interference pattern gets blurred, so the fringe visibility is reduced. And the more the phase fluctuates, the more blurred the interference pattern becomes and the lower the fringe visibility becomes. So what determines by how much the phase difference fluctuates? If we assume that the phases of both slits, so phi1 and phi2, fluctuate randomly, then it is the correlation between the fluctuations at these two points that determine how much delta phi fluctuates. For example, if the fluctuations in phi1 and phi2 are perfectly correlated, then delta phi is constant in time, and a clear interference pattern will form. But if the fluctuations in phi1 and phi2 are completely uncorrelated, then delta phi varies a lot in time, and no interference fringes can be observed. This is basically the difference between coherent and incoherent light. Light with high coherence means that the fluctuations are highly correlated, which means we can get a high fringe visibility. So what determines whether the fluctuations between different points in a field are correlated or not? Suppose we have a point source that emits spherical wavefronts. If the field that is emitted by the point source is monochromatic, then the spacing between all the wavefronts are perfectly equal, so no random fluctuations can occur. Therefore, let's assume that the light from the point source is not perfectly time harmonic, so that there is some slight variation in the distances between the wavefronts. Let's describe the field that is emitted by the point source as a function of time u of t. If the time it takes for the wavefront to reach the slits is respectively tau1 and tau2, then the fields at the slits are given by u of t minus tau1 and u of t minus tau2. More specifically, tau is given by the distance between the source and the slit divided by the speed of light. So how much are the fields u of t minus tau1 and u of t minus tau2 correlated? If the distances from the source to the slits are the same, then the fields at the two slits are the same, so their fluctuations are perfectly correlated, and so a clear interference pattern will form. Now what if we put our point source at a location so that the distances between the source and the two slits are not the same? More precisely, let's say that the times it takes for the field to reach the two slits differ by an amount delta tau. Then we must check the correlation between the field emitted at a time t and the field emitted at a time delta tau later. The degree to which these fields are correlated depends on the bandwidth of the source. 
So if the source only emits one wavelength, the fields are perfectly correlated, but if the source emits a broad range of wavelengths, the fields are poorly correlated. This property is called the temporal coherence of a field. So fields with a narrow bandwidth have a high temporal coherence, and fields with a broad bandwidth have low temporal coherence. If a field is almost monochromatic, but not quite because it still has a finite bandwidth, which in this case is called the line width, we call it quasi-monochromatic. For the next part of our discussion, let's assume we have quasi-monochromatic point sources, so point sources with a high temporal coherence. Because they have a high temporal coherence, each point source creates an interference pattern with clear fringes, and the position of the interference pattern depends on the position of the point source. So if we have multiple quasi-monochromatic point sources at different locations, we get multiple shifted interference patterns. Because the different point sources are independent, their fluctuations are uncorrelated, and so the intensities of their interference patterns add incoherently. And this means we observe an interference pattern with reduced fringe visibility. The correlation between the fields at different points in space x1, x2 for a quasi-monochromatic field determines the spatial coherence of a field. Note how in our example the spatial correlation of the field changes over different planes. In the source plane, the point sources are independent and the fields are therefore completely uncorrelated, so the field is spatially incoherent. However, in the double slit plane the fields at the two points are somewhat correlated, because each point source generates a field at the two slits that is highly correlated. Therefore, we see that in general the propagation of a field tends to increase its spatial coherence. Another useful result that becomes apparent is that the size of an extended source determines the spatial coherence of a field, and therefore the fringe visibility. For a single point source, the field has a high spatial coherence, and we can observe a clear interference pattern. When we add independent point sources, or make the source larger, then the spatial coherence decreases, and the fringes become less visible. Conversely, we can look at the interference pattern of a source and from the fringe visibility infer the source size. This is for example used in stellar interferometry to determine the angular size of a star. Also, this observation confirms our previous observation that propagation of a field tends to increase its spatial coherence, because the farther away you move from a source, the smaller it becomes to you, and we know that smaller sources generate fields with higher spatial coherence. So to summarize this first part, We've seen that coherence can be interpreted as the ability of a field to create interference fringes, which depends on how correlated the random fluctuations of a field are. We made the distinction between temporal and spatial coherence. Temporal coherence describes the correlation between fluctuations of a field at a certain position at different points in time, and it can be thought of intuitively as the bandwidth of the light. Spatial coherence describes the fluctuations of a field at different points in space, and can be thought of intuitively as being closely related to the size of an extended source. As we saw in the example of the off-axis point source, the fluctuations at different points in time and fluctuations at different points in space are not entirely unrelated, but it is often still very useful to make the distinction between temporal and spatial coherence. Now that we've gained a bit of intuitive understanding of coherence, let's introduce the mathematical tools that are required to make our understanding more precise. We're going to look at how we can use complex notation to describe time-dependent fields, and how we can calculate time average intensities from complex time-dependent fields. Let's first recall how we introduced complex notation to describe time-harmonic fields. A time harmonic field is described by a function of the form u of x and t is equal to a of x times cosine phi of x minus omega t. We observe that if we write the field as the real part of a complex valued function a of x times e to the power i phi of x times e to the power minus i omega t, we can omit the redundant time dependent part so that we are left with a complex valued time independent function to describe a field. And so we can write the real field as the real part of a complex field u of x times e to the power minus i omega t. Let's see if we can extend this reasoning to fields that are not time harmonic. In general, we can write a real time dependent field as the sum of time harmonic waves by applying a Fourier transform. Since we know how to turn a real time harmonic field in a complex valued function, we can straightforwardly define the time dependent complex valued field as the sum of complex valued time harmonic fields. Now let's see how we can calculate the time averaged intensity. First, let's find an expression for the instantaneous intensity, which is defined by the square of the real field. 
If we substitute this field by its Fourier transform, we get a double integral in which the product of two cosines occur. By applying a trigonometric identity to this product of cosines, we get two integrals. In one integral, there is a cosine containing the sum of frequencies, omega plus omega prime, and in the other integral, there is a cosine containing the difference of frequencies, omega minus omega prime. When calculating the time average intensity, we must integrate over time, and when we do that, all the terms that oscillate over time vanish. The only term that remains is the one where omega minus omega prime is equal to zero. So we find that the time average intensity is found by adding the squares of all Fourier coefficients together. So how do we find the time average intensity from the complex valued field rather than the real valued field? If we take the time average of the squared modulus of the complex valued field, we find by writing the double integral and cancelling the terms that oscillate in time, that we get the same expression we found previously for the time average intensity, aside from an uninteresting factor of one half. So, our conclusion is that we can find the time average intensity from a complex valued field by taking its modulus squared and integrating over time. But why do we even want a time dependent complex function? Initially, when we were only considering time harmonic fields, our motivation for a complex valued function was to eliminate time dependence. So, why do we need a function that is complex and time dependent? The reason is that it simplifies the computation of time averages. Consider the real field a of x times cosine phi of x minus omega t, so its complex field is a of x times e to the power i phi of x times e to the power minus i omega t. Then the square of the real field still depends on time, so taking the time average is not entirely trivial. However, the squared modulus of the complex field is independent of time, so taking the time average is extremely trivial. This property will be very helpful when calculating time average intensities of more complicated fields. With this result, let's now analyze the double slit experiment quantitatively. We have two slits at positions x1 and x2, and in each slit we can define the complex valued time dependent field u of x and t. We consider a certain observation point on a faraway screen, and the distances from that point to the two slits are r1 and r2. Remember from our discussion on the Rayleigh-Sommerfeld integral and Huygens principle that each point source emits a spherical wave, and that wave will arrive at the screen a time tau later, where tau is equal to the distance between the slit and the observation point divided by the speed of light. If we assume that z, the distance to the screen, is large, then we can consider the prefactors z over r squared to be constant, so we can ignore them. The field at the observation point can then be written as u of x1 t minus tau1 plus u of x2 t minus tau2. Now let's see what happens if the fields at the two slits are monochromatic fields with an angular frequency omega. In that case, we can write the fields as u times e to the power minus i omega t. The measured intensity will be the time average intensity at the observation point, and we've seen previously that we can find the time average intensity by taking the time average of the squared modulus of the complex valued field. We plug in our choices for ux1t and ux2t in this expression, and expand the product. What we see is that by doing so, we end up with an expression that does not depend on time, so we can omit the brackets that indicate the time average. Notice that this happened because we used complex valued time dependent fields rather than the real valued physical time dependent fields. To rewrite the last term of this expression, we can use the fact that a complex number plus its complex conjugate is equal to two times its real part. If we assume that the fields at the two slits have equal amplitude and a fixed phase difference phi, and define the time difference tau as tau2 minus tau1, we find that the measured intensity is given by 2 times 1 plus cosine omega tau plus phi. This describes the familiar interference pattern. Now let's see what happens if we have quasi-monochromatic light, which means that the fields predominantly oscillate with an angular frequency omega, but there will be some temporal fluctuations that are described by u1 of t and u2 of t. We can again write the measured intensity as the time average of the squared modulus of the total complex valued field and expand this expression. Now let's assume that again u1 and u2 have equal amplitudes and a phase difference phi. But now, in addition, u1 has phase fluctuations given by phi1 of t, and u2 has phase fluctuations phi2 of t.
If we define tau to be the time difference tau 2 minus tau 1, and phi t to be phi 1 t minus tau 1 minus phi 2 t minus tau 2, then we can write the observed intensity as 2 times 1 plus the interference term. In this case, the interference term includes the time average over the difference between the phase fluctuations phi t. If this time average is equal to 1, then we obtain the same expression we got for monochromatic light. But when is it 1? And when is it not 1? And what happens if it's not 1? So let's have a closer look at this time average of the phase fluctuations. Recall that taking the time average means integrating over a sufficiently long time interval and then dividing by the length of that interval. We can approximate this integral as a discrete sum of n time intervals with length delta t, and we see that this can be written as the average of n complex exponentials. Now let's see how this average depends on phi of t by drawing these complex exponentials as vectors in the complex plane. If the phase fluctuations phi1 and phi2 are perfectly correlated, then their difference phi is constant in time, meaning that the factors will all point in the same direction, making the resulting sum of the factors as long as possible, and the modulus of the time average of e to the power i phi will be equal to 1. If the fluctuations are somewhat correlated, but not perfectly, then the factors will point somewhat in the same direction, but the resulting sum of the factor is not as long as it could be, and the time average will be less than 1. If the fluctuations are completely uncorrelated, the factors will point in random directions, and the resulting sum of the factors will become very small, and the time average will tend to zero. So what does this mean for the interference pattern of the double-slit experiment? Recall the expressions we obtained for the observed intensity in the case of monochromatic light and quasi-monochromatic light. We see that if the phase fluctuations are perfectly correlated, so that the modulus of the time average of e to the power i phi of t is equal to 1, then we get the same expression as for monochromatic light, which results in a clear interference pattern with high fringe visibility. If the fluctuations are completely uncorrelated, so that the time average of e to the power i phi of t is equal to 0, then the interference term vanishes completely, so that no interference fringes can be seen. If the fluctuations are somewhat correlated, so that the time average of e to the power i phi of t is somewhere between 0 and 1, then we see fringes in the interference pattern, but with reduced visibility. More generally, we can write the expression for the observed intensity for arbitrary u and expand it. This expression is simplified by assuming that the random fluctuations are a wide sense stationary process, which means that the time average of u doesn't depend on the absolute time t, and the correlation between u at two different points in time only depends on the time difference tau between them. We now end up with an expression consisting of two constant terms which don't depend on tau, and one interference term that depends on the correlation between the fields at the two slits. It is this term that decides whether one can see fringes or not. So we see that coherence describes how correlated the fluctuations in the field are, and if the coherence is high, it means that the fluctuations are highly correlated and that clear interference fringes can be formed. This function, describing the correlations between the field at two points x1, x2 separated by a time interval tau, is called the mutual coherence function, which takes into account both temporal and spatial coherence. In case the light is temporally coherent, so quasi-monochromatic, then the time interval tau can be factored out and only the spatial coordinates x1 and x2 are relevant. In that case, we can define the mutual intensity. Although these functions give us some information about the coherence properties of the field, it's difficult to tell directly from the mutual coherence function or mutual intensity how coherent the field is. For example, if j x1 x2 is equal to 0 for a certain pair of points x1 x2, does that mean the field is incoherent? Or is the field coherent, but the intensity at x1 or x2 happens to be zero? In order to avoid such confusion, we also introduced a complex degree of coherence, which is the mutual coherence function, or mutual intensity, normalized by the intensity, so that they'll give a value between zero and one, indicating how coherent a field is for a certain pair of points. Young's double slit experiment is mostly useful for studying spatial coherence. For temporal coherence, let's have a look at the Michelson interferometer. In a Michelson interferometer, we start with a beam that is sent through a beam splitter. The beam is split into two separate beams that each hit a mirror and are sent back through the beam splitter, after which the two reflected beams overlap and interfere with each other on a screen. We can write the incident beam as a time-dependent complex field U of t, so that the two beams at the screen can be written as U of t minus tau 1 and U of t minus tau 2, where tau 1 and tau 2 are the times it takes for the two beams to reach the screen.
We can calculate these times by dividing the total path length by the speed of light. To find the intensity on the screen, we take the time average of the squared modulus of the total field. We can expand this expression and simplify it by introducing the time delay difference tau, which is equal to tau2 minus tau1. In the case of monochromatic light with angular frequency omega, we can write u of t is equal to e to the power minus i omega t. How will the intensity pattern change as a function of tau? If we put the expression for u in the expression for the intensity, we find that the intensity is equal to 2 times 1 plus cosine omega tau. This means that if we vary tau by moving the position of one of the mirrors, the measured intensity will oscillate periodically. By how much should the path length difference change in order to observe one oscillation? We know that in order to go through one oscillation, tau has to change by 2 pi over omega. We can use the fact that tau is equal to the path length difference divided by the speed of light and the fact that omega is equal to k times c where k is equal to 2 pi over lambda to find that the path length difference should change by one wavelength in order to go through one oscillation. Note that because the beam has to go from the beam splitter to the mirror and back, the mirror has to be moved by half a wavelength in order to observe one oscillation. Now what happens if the light is polychromatic, so it consists of many different wavelengths and therefore many different angular frequencies omega? Let's look at the interference term. If we plug in our expression for u of t, we get the product of two integrals, which we can write as a double integral over omega and omega prime. We can rearrange the complex exponentials so that we have one exponential that does not depend on time and another exponential that depends on omega minus omega prime times t. We're taking the time average of this integral, and this means that the time-dependent exponential only gives a non-zero contribution when it's not oscillating in time, which means that omega should be equal to omega prime. We can use this to reduce the double integral to a single integral over omega. This integral involves the modulus squared of u hat of omega, which is the spectral density of the field, since it indicates how much of each frequency omega is present in the field. So we end up with an expression that basically tells us that the interference term is equal to the Fourier transform of the spectral density of the field. Or since we have to take the real part of this, we find that the total intensity as a function of the time delay tau is given by the cosine Fourier transform of the spectral density of the field plus a constant offset. What this means is that we can reconstruct the spectrum of a light field using a Michelson interferometer in a method called Fourier transform spectroscopy. In this method, we move one mirror to change the time delay tau, and we measure the intensity as a function of tau, and then we Fourier transform the result to find the spectrum. These results also motivate a measure for temporal coherence, which is called the self-coherence, and it basically tells us how much correlated a field u of t is with itself a time delay tau later. We can normalize the expression to find the complex degree of self-coherence. Another application of this setup is optical coherence tomography, or OCT. In this method, we want to inspect a thick sample slice by slice. If we use light with a very broad bandwidth, then the interference term is large for only a very narrow range of tau. So if we assume that each slice in the sample acts as a sort of mirror, then by moving the sample, we can decide for which slice interference can occur. In this way, we can study the sample slice by slice. Now that we have some understanding of what it means for a field to be spatially or temporally partially coherent and how to measure the coherence, let's see how we can calculate how partially coherent fields propagate. Let's first start with temporally partially coherent fields. We've seen that temporal coherence relates to fields being composed of different wavelengths, so let's define two time harmonic fields u1 and u2 with angular frequencies omega1 and omega2. If we add them together and see what the time average intensity is, we see that by expanding the expression, the interference term contains the time average of the complex exponential e to the power i omega 1 minus omega 2 t. This time average will be zero if the complex exponential oscillates in time, which is the case whenever omega 1 and omega 2 are different. If they are equal, the time average will be 1. This means that if we add fields of the same frequency, they add coherently, which means that if you want to find the total intensity, you have to add the fields together and then take the squared modulus. This also implies that interference can occur between the two fields. However, if we add fields of different frequencies, they add incoherently, which means that if you want to find the total intensity, you have to add the intensities of the two fields together, which also means that the fields cannot interfere. So what does this mean for the propagation of temporally partially coherent fields? If a field is temporally partially coherent, it can be decomposed in time harmonic components, 
We know how to propagate a time harmonic field, namely by applying a propagation operator such as the Angular Spectrum Propagator, Fresnel Propagator or Fraunhofer Propagator. To find the intensity of the propagated field, we have seen that we can simply add together the intensities of all time harmonic fields. We can put this in a slightly different way, which will later be helpful in understanding the propagation of spatially partially coherent fields. We can write the field as the sum of different frequencies. Each frequency corresponds to a so-called mode of the field. To find the propagated intensity, we must propagate each mode coherently, and then add all the propagated modes incoherently. Now let's look at spatially partially coherent fields. Recall that we describe a spatially partially coherent field by using the mutual intensity function, which describes the correlation between the fields at two points in space x1, x2. If we want to propagate the field from one plane to another plane, then the mutual intensity function must describe the correlation between all pairs of points in the plane. Since each point is defined by two coordinates x and y, we end up with a mutual intensity function that is four-dimensional, so you can expect that propagating this function will in general not be a trivial thing to do. In order to come up with the propagation formula, we assume that the fluctuations of the field are ergodic, which means that we can replace the time average with an ensemble average, where each element un of the ensemble is a time harmonic field. It is useful to make this assumption because we already know how to propagate time harmonic fields. If we assume Fresnel or Fraunhofer propagation, then we can propagate a time harmonic un by multiplying it with a function t of x and Fourier transforming the result. In the case of Fresnel propagation, this t of x will be a quadratic phase vector, and in the case of Fraunhofer propagation, it will be 1. But it could also be the transmission function of a sample, if the field is propagating through a sample. To find the mutual intensity function in the second plane, we must calculate the correlations for all pairs of points x1, x2 in this plane. If we plug in our expression for the propagated field, which is described by a two-dimensional integral, we end up with a product of two two-dimensional integrals, which can be written as one four-dimensional integral, of which we have to take the ensemble average. Taking the ensemble average of the integral means taking the ensemble average of the product ux1, ux2 conjugate that occurs in the integral, and this average is precisely the definition of the mutual intensity function of the field in the initial plane. Therefore, we have found a formula relating the mutual intensity function in the source plane to the mutual intensity function in the observation plane, which basically involves a four-dimensional Fourier transform. To find the intensity in the observation plane, we need to evaluate the mutual intensity function in x1 is equal to x2. Let's see how we can use this result to derive the van sittert zernike theorem and see whether the results make sense intuitively. The van sittert zernike theorem concerns itself with the following question. If we have some incoherent intensity distribution i of x in the source plane, what will the mutual intensity function in the far field look like? To answer this question, let's see how we can describe the mutual intensity function in the source plane. Because the intensity distribution is completely incoherent, the correlation between any two different points x1, x2 is zero, which is described by a delta function. In case x1 is equal to x2, the mutual intensity function should return the intensity in that point, which is in this case given by i of x. Therefore, we can write the mutual intensity function in the source plane as i of x1 times delta x1 minus x2. We then find the mutual intensity function in the observation plane by using the propagation formula we derived earlier, with tx is equal to 1, since we are considering far-field propagation. The delta function allows us to reduce the four-dimensional integral to a two-dimensional integral, and we find that the mutual intensity function in the observation plane is given by the Fourier transform of the intensity distribution, evaluated in x1 minus x2 divided by lambda z, where z is the propagation distance. So what does this result mean, and how can we see whether it makes sense? First, we see that the correlation depends only on the difference between x1 and x2, which means that if we pick any pair of points, the correlation between their fields will be the same if we move the pair around, which is not generally the case for spatially partially coherent fields. Secondly, we see that if the size of the source distribution is smaller, the coherence length in the far field will be larger. This is consistent with the observation we made earlier that spatial coherence is closely related to the source size and that smaller sources correspond to more coherent fields. We see that if we have a point source, then i of x is a delta function and we see then that the far field is fully coherent, as we would expect.
We also see that because of the scaling factor lambda z, if the propagation distance z becomes larger, the coherence width increases, which is consistent with our earlier observation that propagation tends to improve spatial coherence. Lastly, it should be mentioned that this result tells us that we can measure the coherence structure of for example starlight and use it to infer the intensity distribution of the star. When discussing temporally partially coherent fields, we saw that we could propagate the field by decomposing it into modes, propagating each mode coherently, and adding the intensities of the propagated modes incoherently to find the propagated intensity. In this case, each mode corresponded to a certain wavelength of light. Now we will see that also in the case of spatial partial coherence, we can decompose the field into modes to propagate it. In order to do this, we must know two properties of the mutual intensity function. Firstly, it follows from the definition straightforwardly that it is Hermitian, meaning that if we swap x1 and x2, we get the conjugate of the function. Secondly, the mutual intensity function is positive semi-definite, which is much less trivial to demonstrate, but let's just assume that this is true. When these two conditions are met, we can apply a mathematical theorem called Merce's theorem, which says that the mutual intensity function can be decomposed into a set of modes phi n. We can write down how the propagated intensity is found in the coherent case, and we can write down how the propagated intensity is found in the spatially partially coherent case using the expression we found for mode decomposition. We end up with a sum of four-dimensional integrals. Each four-dimensional integral can be written as the squared modulus of a two-dimensional integral, which corresponds precisely to the propagated intensity of a coherent field. Therefore, we find just like in the case for temporal partial coherence that we can find the propagated intensity by decomposing the field into modes, propagating each mode coherently, and adding the modes incoherently. The less coherent a field is, the more modes are required. For example, if the field is fully coherent, a single mode is enough. But if the field becomes less coherent, more modes are required. This is the same as in the case for temporal partial coherence, where if the field is less coherent, it means it consists of more wavelengths, which means the field consists of more modes. To summarize this entire discussion on coherence, let's give an overview of all the different measures for the degree of coherence. One measure of spatial coherence is the fringe visibility of an interference pattern. The more coherent a field is, the higher the fringe visibility. The visibility can be quantified by dividing twice the amplitude of the fringes by twice the average intensity. We can also quantify the degree of coherence by the coherence width, which is roughly speaking the distance the two slits should be apart in order to form clearly visible fringes. In general, if the distance between the slits is made smaller, a clearer interference pattern is formed. Another measure is the number of modes in which the mutual intensity function is decomposed. The more modes are required, the less coherent the field is. In the case of temporal coherence, we can quantify the degree of coherence using the bandwidth of the spectrum of the field. The higher the bandwidth, the more frequencies the field consists of, so the lower the degree of coherence. We can define the coherence time as 1 divided by the bandwidth, which indicates over what time interval a field is still correlated with itself. If we multiply the coherence time with the speed of light, we find the coherence length, which indicates over what propagation distance a field is still correlated with itself. Roughly speaking, it corresponds to how far one can move one arm of a Michelson interferometer and still see interference between the two beams. We can rewrite the expression for the coherence lengths in terms of the central wavelength lambda and the range of wavelengths delta lambda of which the field is composed. We find that the shorter the range of wavelengths is compared to the central wavelength, the longer the coherence length. 